Hello everyone, it's great to be here at the Web Summit. Excited to present our open web vision and uh, let's dig in. So if you don't know who I am, I'm, for about 10 years I've been actually working on machine learning and uh, have, was one of the top contributors to TensorFlow, built kind of uh, AI models that are powering right now natural language understanding. And we started an AI startup called Near AI with the idea of teaching machines to code. But the story goes that as we were building this, we built a platform where we needed to pay people around the world and being able to do that is actually really hard even in the modern world, right? We had people in China, we had people in Russia, in Cuba that were working on our crowdsourcing platform to generate data and it was extremely hard to send money in all those countries. And so we started looking at blockchain first as an idea that kind of a money, like platform to send funds around the world in easy way. And at that point we realized that the current technology back then in 2018 did not match our expectations. And so we started near protocol. And so if you're not familiar with kind of blockchain space, there is kind of three steps of evolution of uh, kind of blockchain and open web. The first step was open money. And open money is really this idea that Bitcoin brought, this idea that you can have global money that are not controlled by any single entity. There's no issuer, there's no kind of bank that you need to put this money in. You user, as a user, control them. And then we had uh, Ethereum coming in and pretty much introducing that instead of just using kind of finance and sending transactions, uh, financial transactions, you can actually build a whole financial ecosystem. And so right now it's called DeFi or open finance and this really allows kind of with you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of capital now to create lending protocols, you know, derivatives protocols, all kinds of financial primitives that are um, like exist in the real world but now don't need to kind of rely on banks, don't need to rely on central authority, don't need to be kind of crashed by uh, some kind of mispricing things that have happened in 2008. And kind of realization was that what we wanted to build was really beyond that, right? We wanted to use finance, we wanted to use kind of uh, funds to send around the world, but we really wanted to build something more. We wanted to kind of build a platform that would scale to all of the applications. And if you open your mobile phone, right, you have probably a couple banking apps or a couple apps that, uh, you know, for investment, but most of the applications are actually social. Uh, they allow you to do kind of some services in your country. They allow you to buy things and participate in the economy, order food, etc. And so those are applications we're calling kind of that consist open web that have billions of users. And so what is open web, right? Kind of the, it's really hard to define it except by saying a set of philosophies, right? Set of kind of principles that uh, describe if it's open web or not, right? And first and foremost, it is decentralized, which means there's no single server or single company that is responsible for it running. Which means that if you know some country or some government decides to shut it down, if this business goes kind of out of, out of business, like you don't need to, um, you don't need to be scared of that. But what it allows you to do now is being able to compose these applications, being able to compose these businesses in kind of exponential way. Because you don't need to have reliability on single business. You can now rely on kind of code and this idea of open web. And you can build your financial app on the financial app that was built by, you know, two punks in some garage and uh, pretty much rely because you know what runs underneath. It obviously is permissionless. And permissionless maybe doesn't mean much for many people, but many services in, in kind of that you're using right now have kicked out people or have not let some people in for whatever reason, right? And some reasons are valid, some are not, but it's not uh, kind of like by definition if you start creating some boundaries and, and some permissioning, you are pretty much creating this closed ecosystem that is biased in some way. We also kind of want users to be owning their data and owning their assets, right? If you think of it as a user right now, when you're using Facebook or now Meta, all your data belongs to Facebook. All your kind of connections, et cetera, belongs to Facebook. When you're moving from one application to another, right, you need to rebuild all this. You need to actually recreate your social graph, re re kind of re-get, re refine your friends and rebuild your uh, kind of connectivity. Whereas if data belongs to you, you can just log in into another app and it will have all your connections and all of your um, 
information as if you use for example different email client and 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 just switch from like outlook to uh for example superhuman and on top of it like the one of the main properties is ability to create this passion economy ownership economy kind of markets and this is important because without that all those things that I explain actually existed for tens of years right this is philosophies that people have tried to build in web when it was just starting but they all failed because the, f the incentives were to build companies that would generate data and kind of hold it and pretty much monetize that. And so it's important to have open markets and kind of economy built around it in such a way that users benefiting from this. So if you're a developer, right, what this means for you is that you can actually build services that rely on other services, right? Again, when we're building startup, you, if you're building on some other startup, you're pretty much now doubling your risk, right? If that startup goes out of business and you're relying on their API or, or on their data, if they go out of business, you pretty much, uh, like, also may have a huge impact. And in this open web principle, because services run kind of in this um, open way and have the source code public, have all of the data in one way or another public, you can rely on this now and build build on top of it really easily. On top of it, because it's open, because you can have this open economy around it, you can have community contributions which are going beyond just software, right? It's not just, you know, people committing stuff on GitHub. You can people doing marketing for you. You can people doing events for you. You can have people kind of contributing in various ways and, and suggesting new ideas. And obviously, for people who've built, done open source, it's actually really hard to have sustainable eco economy around it, right? People asking for donations constantly. And here you can actually build protocols and so kind of open source software which is generating capital for, for its uh, construction. For users, this means that as you go from one application to another, you own the data, right? It's not being kind of used and exploited by some other kind of this company and instead you own it, you can use it, you can go from one application to another and you have all of this uh, data with you. And this is enabled and composability in general enabled by having a set of standards. And again, email is a really good example of kind of, you know, V1 of this where, right, like as you go between different applications, between email servers, you have exactly the same protocol, right? And that's what we want to kind of expand to social graph, to all of these different uh, usages. And on top of it, a lot of us are becoming creators, right? We turn, we kind of moving away from just being a passively reading the information from newspapers to, you know, constantly participating in the social economy and, and, you know, posting content and creating something new. And as a creator, right, right now, all of your platform, all your business is actually belongs to the platform. Like YouTube can ban someone at any time. They can change the rules in any way they want. So creators are able to actually capture the direct um, kind of connection with their community in this open web, right? If, if they're using applications on this platform and being able to interact with them uh, in new ways, right? And NFTs you probably heard of is one of the ways to kind of create this interaction, right? Is by, by pretty much uh, selling some type of pretty much token that communicates that this user indeed is invested in this creator. But there are many other ways you can create and kind of capture this uh, communication. So this is all ideas, but where are we going is we want to bring billion users in to this ecosystem in five years, right? So we want, and like we're going to uh, build this mass adoption of these principles and pretty much trying to displace a lot of the current uh, kind of ecosystem and turn them into this through incentives and through creating open economy. And so what the things we already have, right, this is for developers in, in the room, we already have programmable ownership, right? We're already able to, pro like NFTs, fungible tokens, all of those principal components are just ability to program ownership, which, to be clear, is the first time in the world where it's possible to do. There is financial instruments, there is encryption, storage, and uh, kind of decentralized organizations that are providing you tools to pretty much build this open web businesses. And you potentially, if you've been around in 2017, you probably heard a lot of this, that like, hey, blockchain will be huge in like few years, and not much happened since. And this is true because we didn't have actually a lot of infrastructure, and now we do. So it's past three years, past four years, past. Now we have scalable blockchains. We have uh, kind of economically secured kind of information brought. We have gateways, and we have kind of this ecosystem to build on top. But more importantly, we figured out how to create incentives, how to create these markets 
to actually incentivize people to join these ecosystems, right? And so, f d like open finance and DeFi have been one of the first things that how, like, figured out how to align incentive of dispersing ownership of the protocols and, and uh, of the applications to the user while actually attracting them and creating huge network effects. But the same principles can be applied to pretty much any type of um, any type of application or any type of platform, right? You can actually create incentive of dispersing. Think of it as you giving out Facebook shares for the pe first people who are joining and bringing their friends, right? You're giving them ownership in the platform that they're helping to build, and they'll be inv heavily invested in how to kind of um, like evangelize this platform. So what's next, right? I mentioned few of few of the ideas, but kind of one of the core protocols that's missing right now is social graph, is ability to kind of kind of go around different applications and bring the data about your friends and about your kind of communication with you and being able to build these protocols on top. Right, content, media, music, video is another one. Right now all of the music and videos that you produce actually belongs to YouTube, belongs to Instagram. And so as you go between them, right, you kind of not able to import it with you because they kind of take control of it, they monetize it and they give you some portion of this. There's a lot of different other protocols and you can check it out on, on near.org uh, for more. And so just to give you kind of an example, one of the applications that's built on near called uminter is the idea of pretty much turning Instagram into a open web platform, right? So now you can pretty much take a selfie, you know, mint it as, as, as this non-fungible token, sell it to your uh, kind of fractional, like split it into fractions, sell it to your followers. They are able now to communicate with you directly and this all belongs to you as a creator like the, the kind of the information, the, the, to the tokens, the uh, community belongs to you so you're not actually locked in into this platform. So there can be other applications that are leveraging the same network and, and pretty much building on top of it. And now we are in machine learning stage and I am a machine learning person and so the reality of, of it was kind of through, through the years a lot of people pitch like machine learning and blockchain and until we get to a fair number of kind of users and, and content it's actually been hard to apply machine learning in the space. But we are getting there. We are getting kind of applications that bring user generated content and with that you need machine learning. But you need it in a different way. The things we have done before I worked at Google, right, we just collect all data on our servers and we build machine learning models there, don't work anymore because you actually do not own the data anymore. And now you need to do federated learning. It's ability to build machine learning models on edge, on your phone and pretty much collect kind of the generalized information that then you feed back to the users. You also need to be able to withstand attacks because you are working in kind of open ecosystem and so you need to be able to handle when somebody's trying to attack your models. And all this like first of the use cases if, if you're kind of looking what to do is ability to rank and filter content, right? Because now on blockchain we have a lot of NFTs. We have a lot of kind of uh, things like uh, Uminter which will be providing a lot of content and so being able to rank it in a privacy first way is, is super important and this is what will be kind of um, you know a, a game changer when we're talking about compared to things like Facebook. And so kind of to offset this, one of the things that our community have built, and this is the thing that I mentioned before we were trying to do when we started near, is a crowdsourcing platform, right? And crowdsourcing platforms are important because they actually allow you to collect data to build machine learning models in the first place. And so we've been having this uh, running since April. There's almost 2,000 daily active users uh, kind of every day working on this platform with over 10,000 people total and it's actually collected the biggest data set as far as I know uh, of the image to text um, with 3 million samples, right? And this is kind of because of crypto economics, because of world access, right? We have people in Russia, in Philippines, uh, in India, in, in Latin America working on this at the same time kind of without any boundaries. And actually some people uh, during COVID, especially the tougher times, were able to sustain themselves working on this because uh, that was the only thing they could do not leaving the house. So this is already fundamentally changing both how people build stuff as well how people kind of can earn and interact with this. And it's actually changing people's mind because they realize they can be earning themselves, they can kind of be their own man and, and leave, the, leave the job they for example hate. So I told you a lot about 
things we doing and want to do, but we also have a 800 million in global ecosystem funding to fund projects that are building in this open lab, right? Like this is not just kind of the big idea. This is actually a whole ecosystem with uh, a lot of different components, and you can find place uh, for yourself, right? So we have a number of grants from our near foundation that are dispersed through uh, kind of our grants program. We have, if you're doing specifically financial applications, we have a number of grants for that. If you're kind of in different regions, we are spanning up a, a regional hubs, kind of China, Ukraine, uh, and considering here Lisbon, we have a number of VCs and kind of ecosystem funds that are going to be funding projects in, in, in this kind of ecosystem. So it's really important for kind of for you as you're starting a startup, as you're considering what to do, uh, pretty much this is a wave that's coming. If you're building especially consumer applications, this is a wave that pretty much will be transforming. A lot of VCs right now are actually going away from funding regular consumer applications because they understand that new wave of kind of consumer applications will be coming through this incentive structure with kind of this explosive growth that's possible. So I just want to leave you with the last thing. This space is moving extremely fast, right? Three years ago, none of this, what I just said, existed or was possible. And now we are actually kind of continuously improving and changing what, what things are available. So you should be learning. Uh, we have a really good blog that uh, describes a lot of different components, how things work. We also have launched a near university where you can actually take a course and get a certified developer for blockchain. And we're also launching a lot of other courses, uh, so check it out as it, uh, as it comes. Thank you, and that's, uh, that's all I have. <laughs>